Hey, hello everyone and welcome to this webinar, a joint initiative of the Jewish People Policy Institute and the Jerusalem Press Club. I'm Talia Deco Fleissig, CEO of JPC. Thank you so much to JPPI for your partnership and especially to Professor Yadidia Stern and to Laura Cam for facilitating this event. Uh, during our call, we'll attempt to provide some diplomatic context for the current war Israel is fighting. Um, American support for Israel following the Hamas massacre on Israel's Gaza border towns has remained steadfast. Concurrently, the U.S. is in the Middle East region. Sorry, concurrently, the U.S. interest in Middle East region is at stake, and Iranian proxies have already attacked uh, American bases in Iraq. To discuss these issues and and more, we host Ambassador Dennis Ross, former director of the policy planning at the State Department under President George H.W. Bush former Special U.S. Official Coordinator to the Middle East under President Bill Clinton, and former Special Advisor to Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton. Uh, and he's also, of course, uh, the co-chairman of JPPI. Hello, Ambassador Ross. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, so before we get to uh, the questions that some of the journalists have already submitted in advance of the call, and some of them will uh, send during the call in the chat box, perhaps you can you know, give us a short, uh, a short uh, briefing of your own insight about everything that's going on now. Well, look, I think that the, you put it well, the United States understands and the Biden administration understands very clearly what is at stake right now. Uh, I think there's a lot of speculation about what the U.S. is asking Israel to do, what Israel uh, is, and what those discussions are. I would tend not to read too much into a lot of the speculation about the U.S. asking Israel for restraint or Israel not to do a ground um, assault into Gaza. I don't think that's really the discussion at all. I do think there have been discussions about understanding better what the Israeli military strategy is going to be. Uh, it's not a case of coordinating that strategy, but it's the case of having the discussions about it. I think the the objectives are very similar that Hamas must not, must not be in a position ever again to threaten Israel, that Hamas uh, has demonstrated that it really is the equivalent of ISIS. We wouldn't, we wouldn't accept ISIS living next door to us. And I think there's a clear understanding that Israel shouldn't be expected to have ISIS living next door to it. So you see an American interest in deterring an expansion of the war. Uh, the buildup of American forces in the region is actually quite impressive, not just the two carrier strike groups, but enhancement of readiness. Uh, the, the strike groups themselves are actually pack an enormous amount of power. There's a lot of signaling going on from the U.S. Uh, and the fact that you had a U.S. destroyer intercept and destroy four missiles from the Houthis and 15 drones. And these were not targeted on the U.S. forces were actually uh, fired against Israel. So it says that the words of the American president are being backed by actions. Uh, so why don't I stop there and leave plenty of time for questions? Sure. OK, so, I mean, one of the first things that you mentioned was, you know, the fact that despite what people are saying, that there are no expectations for or against a ground invasion. But does the U.S. have expectations about what the day after looks like like what does it want to see at the end of the day in in the area for israel for the palestinians well i think they're look i think developing a day after strategy is critical because it's not enough for israel to go in destroy the hamas military structure infrastructure uh decimate its leadership effectively undermine its whole capacity for command and control and do a serious disarming of, of Hamas as a military organization, you then create a, a vacuum. So there, are, something will fill the vacuum and you don't, you don't want a military operation that doesn't have a political end. So there has to be a day after strategy. Uh, it's pretty clear at this point that Israel is more focused on what it's seeking to do to basically ensure that Hamas isn't in a position to control Gaza in the aftermath of what it does, uh, and it isn't in a position to prevent what it has always prevented before. The result of this needs to be a kind of what I call a formula of 
demilitarization of Gaza in return for a massive reconstruction of Gaza. The ability to do that requires an interim administration. It requires those who are prepared to commit to funding the massive reconstruction. It requires a mechanism to ensure that materials that go into Gaza uh, actually end up being used for their what they're intended for. Uh, it means having some kind of police presence to provide security for civil administration. Um, I can't speak for the administration. I can speak for myself and say, uh, I would like to see uh, a new administration with technocratic uh, Palestinians running it. Some could be from Gaza, some may be from the diaspora, some may be from the West Bank. There needs to be an international umbrella. Uh, and I would say that needs to include uh, Arabs as well as those from outside the region. Uh, I think some of the police forces could could also come from the different Arab states. Uh, the funding needs to come from from the the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Qataris. If the Qataris can have helped to fund Hamas and Gaza, they can surely help fund the reconstruction that is needed precisely because of what Hamas has inflicted on Gaza. Uh, so putting all that together, I think, is will ultimately be something that is the U.S. should be doing. In effect, what we're looking at is a day after that wouldn't be possible without the U.S. mobilizing uh, a more collective response. We're reminded again, there really isn't anybody else who can play this role internationally other than the United States. So I think it very much depends on the, U the U.S. being able to play it. It also depends on Israel conducting the war in a way, and this is what you hear a lot from, from the administration, doing it in a way that, that demonstrate Israel is out there inflicting this decisive defeat on Hamas its aim is not to publish the Palestinian people who live in Gaza. You need to draw that distinction. Uh, and, and I would see, I think it's important that uh, Israel also make a serious effort to provide for corridors for humanitarian assistance. I noted uh, the Israeli Defense uh, Forces spokesperson yesterday talking about corridors in the South uh, where there could be humanitarian assistance for the Palestinians in Gaza who, who move from the north to the south. I think creating those corridors and making sure there is humanitarian assistance there uh, will certainly create a better context in which the, the fight against Hamas can be conducted and we can set the stage for what comes afterwards. I'm going to go in reverse chrono chronological order, even though it doesn't necessarily make sense, but I want to continue from what you were saying early on in terms of um, filling in that vacuum and an, an interim administration. Um, one journalist is asking about the role that the PA, if at all, would have in this uh, in in this uh, in in this uh, hierarchy. Um, does Abu Mazen have a role to play? Does he have any legitimacy anymore? Well, I think the, the PA itself is too weak to play a role in the immediate term. Uh, and one can understand that the PA wouldn't want to rush in in any case. I don't think they have the means to do it but they wouldn't want to do it in any case. And the truth is you need some kind of interim administration. You need a transition period. It would be good over time if there was such a, if the PA could assume a role somewhere down the road. But I think that also requires some reform within the PA itself. You're gonna have, if there's gonna be a massive reconstruction program for Gaza, which will be needed, uh, the fact is the donors are gonna to wanna to know that there's transparency in this operation. Uh, maybe some of them are prepared to commit to investment in the in the West Bank as well, but they're not going to do it unless there's transparency there as well. So it really calls for reform on the PA side uh, in parallel with what's being done within Gaza itself. Okay, thanks. Now going back back in back in time to where we are now. Uh, one journalist is asking. Uh, you mentioned obviously the humanitarian issues. Uh, as as civilian deaths are likely to rise, especially if, of course, the a ground invasion occurs or you know Israel ups its its operational uh, tactics, do you think uh, that this will impact international support of Israel and the American support of Israel specifically when we see a rise in uh, civilian deaths? Well, we're seeing a obviously a rise in civilian deaths already, uh, and it is affecting obviously the attitude of some. 
Uh, it is important to remind everybody again and again of exactly what Hamas has done. Uh, the unspeakable atrocities, uh, which are, you know, there is no, no cause that justifies that. Any cause that seeks to justify it delegitimizes that cause. So there, it's important that there, the, the international community constantly be reminded of exactly what Hamas has done. Look, they're also reminded on a daily basis that Hamas is holding now 218 hostages, uh, as young as nine months old. Uh, this too should be beyond the pale. This too should be something that's unthinkable. But having said what I just said, it is in Israel's interest, it's in the collective interest of everyone who wants to, to not only defeat Hamas, but also discredit it and delegitimize it. And that requires an effort to try to minimize the civilian casualties, but also it, it requires much more of an effort to demonstrate unmistakably uh, that there are real efforts to address the humanitarian needs. When Israel is asking for Palestinians in the northern part of Gaza to move to the south, there is some obligation to help ensure that their human needs are being addressed at the same time. The more that can be done, the more that also, I think, creates a better context in which to pursue the, the military campaign, but also to set the stage for what will come after the military campaign. So uh, just taking a little bit about what you said in terms of ensuring ensuring uh you know civilians are able to 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 get what they need we've heard reports of res you know resources that are being let in even being stolen from unra for hamas by hamas how can israel ensure that the the goods letter are actually being given to the civilians and not taken by the terrorists themselves well I, obviously there needs to be more exposure just like on there was some interesting exposure today about Hamas controls all these fuel depots, and and you know the there is this great great need for fuel to come in so you can run the generators and electricity, run desalinization plants, uh, ensure water pumps are working, you know, the hospitals can function, uh, and Hamas is obviously denying that. So one can highlight that in the end that can't be a denial of of helping to ensure that hospitals and so forth can run. Uh, it also means to try to maximize what can be done to prevent the diversion. There's probably no perfect solution. Just like there's, if Israel had a clean set of options to get rid of Hamas, it would do that. You know, I hear a lot of people, especially in the Arab world, quietly saying, go ahead and crush Hamas, but do it very quickly and do it with no cost. Well, that would be great. It's just that it's not possible. You know, the same thing with humanitarian assistance. Can you guarantee 100% that Hamas can't divert some of it? Probably not, but that can't become an argument that you don't provide anything. Uh, so you, every, you, you're you faced with a set of hard choices and you're trying to strike the most effective posture that also helps achieve what the objectives are. Very clear. Um, you mentioned, of course, the hostages, the children. Uh, as, as a former negotiator, what do you think uh, should be the solution or at least the strategy for releasing them? And does Washington have a role in it? Is it playing it already? Well, it clearly is is trying to affect Qatar. I mean, the, the reality is that Qatar really can't have it both ways. It can't have, it can't provide this kind of safe haven for people like Ishmael, Ishmael Haniya and Khaled Mishal uh, and and give them a platform to you know, try to justify the indefensible and, and then not deliver. I mean, their whole argument is they have a relationship with Hamas and there's a benefit to that relationship. They need to be able to prove it now. They need to be able to demonstrate it now. And while it's, it's, it's wonderful that four hostages have been released, that still leaves 218. And as I said before, with, uh, with babies, I mean, this is, it should be unthinkable. So Hamas needs to demonstrate, I mean, uh, Qatar needs to demonstrate that the relationship it has with Hamas allows it to do something that no one else can do, and that is produce the hostages, get them released. If they're unable to do that, then it, it certainly raises questions, what's the value? How can they justify having a relationship with Hamas if at a time like this they, they can produce so little from it? Now, if they can produce something more, 
I still wouldn't be an enthusiast for the relationship with Hamas, but at least you can you can see that it relieves this terrible uh, reality of hostages whose safety uh, everyone wants to see not only assured, but also we want to see them released. Okay, uh, moving on to some of the other players in the region. Uh, a couple of reporters are asking sim similar questions, more or less surrounding uh, both Iran's role and what the U.S. response to Iran's role should be. Uh, mentioning also Hezbollah attacks, obviously, in the north, mentioning um, proxies, whether it's through the Houthis uh, and so forth. Um, so I think the overall question might be, um, what should U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran specifically uh, in this war uh, should be, and whether it needs to be in the form of uh, further sanctions or even direct involvement should more American uh, assets, troops, et cetera, be targeted? I think Iran should realize it's playing with fire right now, uh, increasing its uh, attacks through its proxies against our presence in Iraq and Syria uh, you know, in the end, it's very clear these are proxies. Uh, and the orders, the training, the arming, uh, the funding comes from Iran. Uh, right now, I think the U.S. is focused on deterrence. Uh, and it should be focused on deterrence. I don't think anybody has an interest in a wider war. But in the end, the Iranians shouldn't have an interest in a wider war that has the risk of sucking them in. Iran is very good at fighting to the last of its proxies. It's never itself too keen on exposing itself to conflict. It needs to understand that it's running a risk when it comes to this. And if the war expands, the idea that it will be immune from all this is an illusion. So for now, the focus is on deterrence and the US is the significant increase in America's military presence tends to, under, uh, tends to underpin that message of deterrence. As I said earlier, the American destroyer that shot down the, the Houthi drones and missiles was an indication that even if we weren't attacked, we would act in the, to prevent such attacks. Uh, they shouldn't even think about attacking our forces, given the potential of what we could do. Um, for later on, I think uh, Iran needs to understand and our posture needs to increasingly focus on how we increase the cost to Iran and the costs have to be costs that the Iranians think matter. You know, many people on the outside can think, okay, we're going to squeeze them this way and this will change their behavior. Uh, obviously, Iran has been prepared to incur a lot of economic costs uh, and still pursue their goals. So one of the things I think in, in the aftermath of this is to think hard about what are the kind of actions that we have seen historically that seem to have the greatest impact uh, on the Iranians as a way of affecting their behavior. Uh, Iran is not, its leaders have not been uh, eager to assume risks. As I said, they're quite, they have no problem fighting the last of their proxies. Uh, the idea that they can always remain immune from this while they can set the rest of the region on fire, uh, we need to sort of take a step back and think about how that calculus on their part can be affected. Okay. And what about Russia? We see that Russia very quickly chose sides probably because of uh, Iran's support uh, against Ukraine. Uh, so, so two questions, what should American policy be in this sense? And obviously what should Israeli policy be in the sense considering its sensitive situation in Syria vis-a-vis -vis the Russians? Well, like I think with the Russians, it's, it's not just that they're getting material support uh, from Iran. Who would have thought before Russia went into Ukraine that they would need to depend upon Iran for provision of drones, and they would need to depend, <clears throat> depend upon uh, North Korea uh, for uh, arms as well. But clearly they do. Uh, what Putin wants is to create as much diversion as possible. He wants to shift attention away. He wants uh, the US to, to have to be tied down more in the Middle East so it can provide less support to Ukraine. Uh, you know, the worst things become here, a regional war here is in his interest, not only because of diversion, but because it would raise oil prices. By the same token, that's the last thing that's, that China wants to see, given its uh, significant economic slowdown. And it's the fact it's the biggest importer of Middle Eastern oil. The last thing it needs to see is a huge 
uptick and a surge in the price of oil. So here's one issue where there's a dissonance between where Russia's coming from and where the where China's coming from. And China has far more leverage uh, on Iran than Russia. China actually has far more leverage on Iran than anyone else. So this is a point where I mean, I think collectively there should be not only from us, uh, but others, uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, who the Chinese want to have a certain kind of relationship with, uh, the Chinese should be hearing from them that, you know, a, a regional war is not in anyone's interest and China, and they are looking to see China use, if, it's, if it has the claim to have influence, it needs to use it. And uh, what about Turkey? We saw that, you know, before everything happens, Israel and Turkey were finally becoming a little bit warmer after everything uh, that had had gone be between them with the uh, with the flotilla, and it's been quite a few years. And finally, things were getting better. And now, obviously, Erdogan came out in support of Hamas because of of natural reasons. But the, is it could could uh, relations between Israel and Turkey in the long term be restored? I think it would be hard uh, when Erdogan describes. Hamas is not being terrorist after what they've done. Turkey tolerates no terrorism against it, but apparently it's prepared to tolerate the most atrocious kind of, of terrorism with, uh, you know, with unbelievable, unspeakable atrocities. He's, he's prepared to explain that away. It'd be hard to see how that will, how that can change, uh, certainly in the near term. One journalist is asking if there's any way that um, the Americans or anyone could can force Hamas into pro into providing proof of life uh, for hostages, at least with with the you know the, the the most vulnerable with the babies. Is there a way of doing it? Well, I don't know what you know. We don't have a relationship with Hamas, so it's pretty hard to see how we could do it. We're obviously at this point trying to work through Qatar, but here again, I mean. The onus should be on Qatar. You have a relationship with Hamas. You know, there is a need. You know, at a minimum, I would think that Qatar has an interest in trying to show or justify why there's some value in having this relationship. I would have to say at this point, um, it's not very persuasive. Uh, maybe they'll surprise us. Maybe they, maybe they will impose something on Hamas where Hamas you know, needs to show proof of life. Uh, Hamas has never operated that way before, or only very rarely. I recall, I think, once or twice they did something with Gilad Shalit before uh, they traded him. But look, uh, I look at Hamas, uh, for all those who say they wanted Israel to come in to walk into a trap in Gaza, I don't believe that at all. I think they seized the hostages because of their experience with Israel. Yahya Sinwar was part of the release in 2011. Yaya Sinwar was the, the architect, the mastermind of this. You know, his experience with Israel trading over a thousand Palestinian prisoners for one Israeli soldier you know, certainly informed his thinking that if we grab large numbers of Israeli hostages, we'll be able to deter the Israelis from coming in and we'll be able to trade them to get something to show even more how we won. So, you know, you're dealing, this is the mindset of Hamas. Uh, and uh, the only thing they're going to understand is if their benefactors like Qatar basically say, okay, we're cutting you off. Um, we met, we talked about Turkey, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, that there's no optimism that things will get back on track uh, anytime soon. What about uh, Abraham Accord countries? Uh, we saw that very quickly, uh, you know, at least the UAE came out in support of Israel against the attacks, uh, but of course the the Saudi gate the Saudi deal never came to fruition. Is that something that needs to be shelved entirely, or do you think we'll be able to get back to it at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later? Well, obviously nothing's going to happen right now. Uh, there's a lot of I think obvious reasons for that. Part of it is I don't think Israel can focus on anything of that sort other than what it's doing right now. The atmosphere created by what's happening in Gaza obviously makes it difficult for the Saudis as well. Although I will tell you why it's why only the UAE and Bahrain uh, have publicly condemned what Hamas did. Uh, it is interesting that if you look at uh, 
parts of the Saudi press, you'll see, for example, the former editor of Shakal Ausid uh, has written, at least I've seen, two different uh, articles he wrote that were very tough in their denunciation of Hamas and what Hamas is once again subjecting the Palestinians in Gaza to. Uh, so there's a little bit of a duality there. We're seeing it generally. I mean, in, in general terms, um, all the Arab governments, all the Arab states uh, are focused on what's happening to the Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Uh, and, uh, and yet privately, uh, one hears from from all of them about it's very important to to crush Hamas, and there's a reason for it because if Hamas appears or emerges from this uh, and is and looks like it was a winner, that means the ideology of rejection is a winner. It means the the Iranian axis uh, is a winner. It means everyone will be put on the defensive. So, you know, it's very clear the outcome of this has to be that Hamas is decisively defeated. And when I say that, what it means is its military infrastructure is destroyed in a way that will make it very difficult to rebuild. Uh, its leadership is, is largely decimated. It loses command control. Uh, the idea that you can eradicate Hamas, you're not going to eradicate Hamas because, it, first of all, it exists outside of Gaza. Uh, secondly, you, know, you, you, you can't find every single Hamas fighter in Gaza, but what you can do is you can you can destroy its military wherewithal. You can isolate uh, and and put uh, you know its its ability to maintain control there. You can re you can remove that. You can reduce that. Uh, and you you want to be in a position where in the aftermath of this, you want to be in a position where in the aftermath of this, Hamas cannot do what it's done before. We've had ceasefires after two thousand nine, after two thousand twelve. After 2014, 2014, 52 days of conflict, massive destruction within Gaza. Talk about uh, significant reconstruction, but it, no one was going to invest in reconstruction if Hamas still had the means at a time of its choosing to attack Israel again, and then Israel retaliates by destroying the very things people invested in. There has to be an outcome that produces the demilitarization of Gaza in return for for massive reconstruction. Uh, that Hamas cannot be in a position to block that again. So the outcome, when you think of the political outcomes, the political outcome has to be Hamas not being able to threaten Israel again, Hamas not being in a position where it can block the ability to, to reconstruct uh, or is in a position where it can rebuild. You have to, have to create a mechanism that will prevent all that. Then you're producing a political outcome that can create an atmosphere where I think the the likelihood of the Saudis moving back into this uh, potential deal with Israel becomes much more uh, much more conceivable. Okay, uh, we have, we still have quite a few questions, so we'll try to get to them all uh, with the time allowing. Well, we <laughs> well time doesn't allow because I have to go. I I had a half hour. Half hour. So maybe just one last question, which I think uh, sure. maybe we'll we'll sum up. Uh, your, you know, your vision, your uh, vision for this for this area, is the two-state solution still viable? One half of the question. Second half of the question, will Israelis, after witnessing the, you know, largest atrocity on its own civilians on its ground ever, be willing to to commit to such a solution after? So let me, let me cast it this way. Um, and I'm glad you asked the question, because, again, it puts in perspective what we've been discussing all along. The end result here has to be to change the reality in the region, weaken this ideology of rejection, demonstrate that uh, the Iranian axis and the use of its of these instruments, these instruments actually get defeated. They don't achieve anything, just the opposite. Uh, within Israel, look, obviously, the focus has to be on what is the, the, the immediate task at hand? Uh, when all this is over, uh, there'll be, there, there will be and there needs to be a debate within Israel. What's the relationship with the Palestinians going to be when this is over? Uh, you can't wish the Palestinians away. They're still going to be there. Uh, just like the Palestinians can't wish Israel away. 
So uh, what I would say is I would expect that there will be a debate in Israel which has not been held, a debate about what the relationship with the Palestinians should be. I can envision two schools of thought. One school will say you can't have a Palestinian state because look, look who could take it over and then look what we face. And the other school of thought will, will be you also you can't freeze the reality exclusively on Israeli terms and have Palestinians live under exclusively Israeli terms uh, and think that if you have basically uh, decimated Hamas, that there won't be a successor to it. The idea that Palestinians will live with no sense of possibility for the future and you won't see extremist groups reemerge is an illusion. So these, these two schools of thought, there needs to be a debate. Now, you can't have the debate now, and you shouldn't have the debate now. But when this is over, uh, there has to be a serious debate within Israel about what the relationship with Palestinians is going to be. You know, it is it is magical thinking to think that, you know, you can ignore this issue. Uh, and it's, you know, this is, I want to conclude with another thought. When I hear people ask me, didn't Hamas do this because there's no possibility, there's no peace process, desperation? And I said, no. When I was negotiating in the 1990s, every time we made progress, there would be a suicide bombing by Hamas. Their purpose was to prevent any possibility of peace and coexistence. Uh, and the reason they, the timing of this, even though it was obviously planned over a long period, the timing of this was their fear about the possibility of Saudi normalization with Israel. It's precisely the fear that there could be peace that brings out Hamas. Now, you have to discredit that ideology. You have to discredit who they are. Their own actions should have discredited them. But now they have to be defeated in a way that demonstrates what they did in the end led to their demise. That has to be the approach now. When this is over, then the debate I described can take place, and frankly, it needs to take place. Ambassador Dennis Ross, uh, your, your sound advice, uh, I hope, falls on uh, attentive ears. Uh, thank you so much for your insight and your time. Here. Thank you. And thank you to our partners at JPPI and to my colleague Ellie Kletstein for facilitating this call. Uh, and have a good evening, everybody.